The following video has been automatically edited by YouTube's automated swearing substitution algorithm, heuristically obstructing or limiting expletives. Look who's back, back again, Nigel Marsh, tell your friends. I'm back, it's Nigel. <laughs> it is, and what a muddy fishing wally. He is too. Yes, yeah. new air. Tell you what, Nigel. Um, shaggy. Uh, it, it, the notice on Twitter that it's trending. World's gone mad, and it bloody has an yeah, all, hasn't it? Stop bloody the world! I want to get off. Oh God, me too. And part of the reason for the madness is, uh, <laughs> apart from more important matters happening in the world now, is uh, changes in landlord legislation for yeah. electrical conditions. Insanity. insanity, insanity. The world's gone mad, Nigel. And uh, let me show you where we are today. We're in a yeah. two-bedroom flat, little two-bedroom flat in Leamington. Nothing uh, controversial. We reckon this is built in the 1990s, don't we? We reckon so, looking at it. Yeah. Living room, kitchen, two bedrooms, bathroom, hallway. That's your lot, Chief. Not a lot to it. Not a lot to it. And, uh, oh, I can film through there, look. There you are. It's like being on TV, isn't it, Nigel? It's about the only thing left on TV now because everything's being pulled. Um, yes. If ever being controversial. We're not controversial, are we, Nigel? You fat whip it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, this flat belongs to a long term client of ours. We've done a lot of work for her over the years, haven't we? Yep. And she foolishly cheated on us. She cheated on us. She did. She asked her letting agency to get a spark in to perform a condition report, which he has duly done. Uh, a big outfit in the area. Uh, a legitimate outfit. Yeah. NAPIT accredited, accredited for condition reporting. Uh, multi-man operation and I believe it was one of the directors of the organisation who undertook the report so he kind of you'd hope that you'd get something sensible I mean obviously we looked at what you got for £85 when you hired a chance who shouldn't be doing condition reports in the first place yeah. fairly recently and that was pretty dreadful the charges for the inspection were £160 plus VAT so that's £192 which um, £160 is what we charge for for the amount of circuits that are here yeah. by going by our per circuit pricing the report has come back as unsatisfactory and a remedial list adding up to £750 plus VAT has been holloped on there, holloped on there. Now, currently the place isn't rented, but from 1st of July, um, any uh, new rentals will have to have an electrical condition report associated with it. Unless it's brand new and it's already covered under an electrical installation yep. certificate, in which case maybe it's been signed off for 10 years. But even if it's been signed off for 10 years as an electrical installation certificate, government guidance or oh, these changes, the landlord regulations say that after five years, you have to get it reinspected if it's a tenancy. So there you go. So if you've already got an electrical installation certificate because the installation you're renting out is less than five years old, then you don't need to get it reinspected unless you've, you hit that five year mark, unless it was done in 2015, you're hitting that five year mark. Yeah. So that's the first thing to say, because a lot of, there's, there's a lot of confusion about all this new landlord stuff. And we're gonna, we're gonna put our interpretation on it in this video, and we're probably gonna get slated in the comments because different people have different interpretations. So we're gonna back up what we say with things like NAPIT code breakers, electrical safety first, the government legislation, and what it says in the wine regs. And we're gonna come up, I suspect, with a different opinion to what this previous guy has said. So had she used us, she probably would have, or may, may well have got a pass, because looking at the guy's report, there's no alarm bells ringing there that I can see that ought to have failed the installation. But it's a Friday, we want an easy day it's on a Friday, Friday, don't we? Day, Friday. So we're gonna spend the day here. Uh, you know, it's it's not, not going to make us rich, is it? But um, two of us being here today, but we're going to have every accessory off. We're going to test every circuit. We're going to do as thorough a report as we can, as we normally do. And we're going to see if this installation really does have alarm bells ringing. I'll tell you what has my alarm bell ringing. Oh, do tell, Nigel. While I was in Furlough, I appear to have grown breasts. <laughs> so if, if you'd like, grow yeah. Just, just ask. No, no, I don't think I'm kind of like, you know. uh, Let's just turn the camera off a minute. First up, let's introduce the board. It's a Mamera 2000, fairly common around here at the end of the 90s. And indeed, we can see the original inspection date was uh, 2nd of December 99. 
interesting that they put only five years on it at the time. So I suspect, because I know we've worked in the flat upstairs, that also has a Mamera 2000. Yeah. I suspect this is the original board and that this place was built in 99, which ties in with our theory that it was built yes. in the 90s. No RCD protection notice. No RCD protection at all. Mm. But that's what we're dealing with. Uh, 10 circuits have been listed on the other guy's report and there are 10 breakers there, which suggests to me that there probably hasn't been any alterations or additions of any significance in the intervening years. So we're probably looking at this kind of as built, as designed by the builder. So let's go and have a look at the guy's report before we get the screwdrivers out. Uh, I've got the covering email here that the electrician from the previous company has sent to the letting agent that has then been forwarded onto the client. And the first thing I take issue with is the wording because it says here, this safety certificate has been issued to confirm that the electrical installation work to which it relates has been designed, constructed and inspected and tested in accordance with British Standard 7671, the IET wiring regulations. Ah. When we talk about design, construction and inspection and testing, if you look at an electrical installation certificate, uh, you will see that that has a section on there that asks about the design, construction, inspection and testing and to what standard it's been done to, which is then signed off by uh, a competent person or a skilled person. Skilled I, mean, person I can't even remember how they've changed it to now. Yeah, so the, the, the person who uh, is taking responsibility for that work signs that off. When we're talking about condition report on an existing installation, we're not talking about the design, construction, and inspection and testing because these are three different periods in history as far as this installation is concerned. It's not, you can't all sign it off as being one event. You can't say design, construction and inspection and testing of this installation meets this regulatory requirement, today's regulatory requirement, because the design predates the building of the place. The design would have been done in the mid to late 90s, construction in the late 90s, and the inspection and testing, well, it's 21 years later now. So we're talking about three different time periods, potentially the different standards of the regulations. And when we're signing off work, what we're doing is we're signing off the design at the time, uh, to, to whatever standard was in place at the time of the design. So, for example, we know there are changes in regulations. A big one was 17th edition Amendment 3, which changed from plastic boards to metal boards. If you were in the middle of building projects and you'd already designed your block of flats or whatever to, com to comply with, um, to, to go by 17th edition Amendment 2, and then the regulations changed after that design, but before you were re re ready to sign it off. Well, that's fine. You can still sign it off to 17th edition Amendment 2, even after Amendment 3 had come into force. You could still have plastic consuming units in there because the design predated the changing regulations. Makes sense, Nigel? Perfect sense, Dave. Um, because these things are moving all the time. I mean, for fuck's sake, we've already had uh, Amendment 1 come out this year, haven't we? Um, the trouble is, like everything else, Government guidance is a load of jolly nonsense. And here's where the confusion lies. The I don't know what it is about people in government or the IT or places like that and why they can't just come up with a common sense idea, why they have to muddy the waters the way they do. 17th edition Amendment 3 was a godsend to cowboy electricians who then go around saying to everybody, You've got a plastic consumer unit, it's got to be changed to metal. And uh, oftentimes a very well installed plastic consumer unit that was put in by an electrician who had some pride in his work and did a very good job and did a, uh, you know, an old school sparky who um, did it all properly. You see that getting ripped out and some shitty metal board plopped in its place, badly done uh, by some cowboy, leaving it full of holes and uh, in a, a much dangerous, much worse condition than it ever was. And this is no different, this change in landlord legislation, because the wording of it is dreadful. Allow me to show you what I mean. So regulations come into force on 1st June 2020 for new tenancies. Existing tenancies have until 1st of April 2021 to come up with their reports. Blah, blah, blah. What do the electrical safety standards in the private rented sector, England, this only applies to England, regulations 2020 require? 
Landlords of privately rented accommodation must ensure national standards for electrical safety are met. These are set out in the 18th edition of the wiring regulations. So what that says basically is your rental must meet 18th edition requirements. Well, that's a bit of a... Ruddy annoyance. Because anything over five years old ain't going to meet 18th edition requirements. So that's, uh, that's a bit scary. Uh, and that's the problem with this installation today, is your man has come in, I've got his report here, and he's compared this installation to 18th, 18th edition, and he's failed it, because obviously it doesn't meet 18th edition, because this installation was put in when 16th edition was in force. Now that may be fair enough, we'll come on to that. If we scroll down further, we get what standards should the electrical installation meet? The standards that should be met are set out in the 18th edition of the wiring regulations. The regulations state that a landlord must ensure that electrical safety standards are met and that investigative or remedial work is carried out if, if the report requires this. Well, the trouble is, electrical installations, when you're inspecting and testing them, obviously you don't, or you shouldn't, fail them if they don't meet the latest standard, just because they don't meet the latest standard. Uh, you should be inspecting them to the standard that they were built to at the time and then making recommendations for how they can be brought up to the latest standard. Take this guy for example, I've blanked out the name to protect the... Protect the guilty. Well, I won't say guilty because he, you know, as far as this is concerned, he's done the right thing here. He's come in and said this doesn't meet 18th edition requirements and reason for producing the report he says on there to confirm the installation meets the current wiring regulations. Well. It doesn't, and nothing over five years old is likely to. So when someone phones him up saying, can you do, come and do an electrical installation condition report on my rental property, I wonder if he says on the phone, yes, but I'm going to fail it, and I'm going to leave you with a, a load of remedial work, because that's effectively what's happening here. He's going to come into any installation older than five years and fail it. Uh, as is anybody else who's comparing to 18th edition. So the, the, the problem here is that any um, anybody who says, well, I, it must meet 18th edition or bust, uh, ought to be saying that when, they, when the customer books them. When they, when they phone up and say, can you come and do my condition report, they ought to say, well, is your installation older than five years? Yeah, well, yes it is. Well, in that case, I'm going to give it a flipping fail then, and I'm going Just to demand... Just over the phone, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to demand that um, you, you fork out for remedial work. Um, but, you know, that's what it says there. Uh, we've always passed older installations so long as uh, they show no signs of degradation, damage, overheating, um, improper modifications, uh, so long as the earthing and bonding are all where they should be because that's your shock protection, so long as the fuses or breakers meet the requirements uh, for protection of the wiring on those circuits, um, then you know the, uh, uh, you've got your overcurrent protection then. So, you do have your safety. Just because things have changed in the intervening years and said, okay, now you need an RCD on here, now you need a metal box, doesn't mean that an older installation is unsafe. And as I've said before, there's multiple sources that back that up. First of all, the wiring regulations of themselves, the very 18th edition that this thing mentions, on page 13, as I've said before, the health and safety executive themselves say that existing installations may have been designed and installed to conform to the standards set by earlier editions of BS 7671. This does not mean that they will fail to achieve conformity with the electricity at work regulations 1989. So that's a health and safety executive saying, look, we don't have to bring an older installation up to meet these standards so long as it is still doing the job that it was there to do in the, in the first place. And we've also got, as we shall look at later, what NAPIT code breakers say, what electrical safety first say. Uh, and again, we've looked at these things before in previous videos, but also this blooming guidance. If you scroll down further, we've seen how black and white it is about saying, well, you should meet the latest regulatory requirements. Let's scroll down. We get this section here. First of all, it says if an inspection took place and a satisfactory report was issued before 18th edition came into force and less than five years ago, do we need to have it re-inspected? And they say, well, no, you don't. Um, if you've already got an inspection report that has signed it off past 
uh, July 2020, then that report still remains valid. But then it goes on to say, existing installations that have been installed in accordance with earlier editions of the wiring regulations may not comply with the 18th edition, no shit. This does not necessarily mean that they are unsafe for continued use or require upgrading. So there you go. It's, it's not as black and white as they say, and I don't know why, why that is, why they can't just, just make a frotting call on it, because at the beginning of this document says, must, must meet 18th edition requirements. Later on it says, older, lanes, older installations won't necessarily, but that doesn't mean they need to be upgraded. So you can't go by this document. It contradicts itself. And the whole point of these landlord inspections, landlord reports, isn't to penalise people who've got decent working installations. It's to penalise landlords who never bother putting any maintenance into their installations. So there's a plenty of people out there, like this site here potentially, we'll look at this, that has what you could say is a safe installation and they're doing their due diligence to get it checked out but it doesn't necessarily need to be brought up to the very latest standard. Now, uh, I know this is going on for ages. We will do some work in a minute, Nigel, honestly. <laughs> I'm just desperate to get some work done. I suppose you could say, well, if you're inspecting somebody's home, if we were inspecting this, the landlady who's put, who's put us on this job, if we were inspecting her own home and her installation was the 16th edition, which it is, I know it is, then, uh, we could say to her, well, look, we recommend that you get it brought up to 18th edition standards. Uh, and here's the benefits that you would get for it. And it's her call to make because she's living with it. She's, she's the one sleeping at night under that roof. Her tenants don't get a say. So I, I get that this is saying your tenants should have all the latest safety standards uh, in place because they're the ones who've got to live here. They're the ones who've got to put up with it. Um, but by the same to token... You can't have this situation where they're suddenly saying, and this is quite sudden, this is all quite new, where they're suddenly saying any every rental accommodation in England now has to be brought up to 18th edition standards before July 2020, because there just aren't enough electricians out there to do that. <laughs> and as I say, there are so many cowboys out there that you would you would be taking existing installations that have been that are old but still doing their, the job they were designed to do and upgrading them to something rather horrendous because there's so much um, so many bad installers out there so our job here today is to not compare this to 18th edition as, as such not to not to write this off as being not 18th edition compliant because we know it's not 18th edition compliant when they designed this place back in the late 90s they didn't have a crystal ball to know what the 18th edition was going to say so our job here today is to look at this installation wholly and see does it still comply with the standards of its time? Is it safe for use by the tenants? Are they, is it safe against risk of shock? Is it safe against risk of overload on final circuits? What's the supply like? Is there any damage, any signs of overheating, any improper modifications, any failures, anything not working? Anything that causes us concern that this installation isn't safe for continued use? Would we want? Would we be happy to live here ourselves? Uh, and um, would there be any any concerns that we'd have? Uh, and obviously, there are going to be elements that don't meet 18th edition. We've already seen there's no RCD on site, but these are going to be recommendations for improvement that we make to the landlady. We could say, well, here's what we would rec recommend you put in to bring it up to standard up to you whether you want to do so or not because ultimately it is i can't go go there and, and force her to do it and there shouldn't be any need to if everything is in place as it was designed because uh, one of the problems as well is if we bring this or anybody else brings this up to today's 18th edition standard and we change the consume unit for a metal board populated with rcds or rcbo's what happens when 19th edition comes out and says you need AFDDs on your circuits now. All these 18th edition installations, if, if you go by what this says in its first few paragraphs, would then be out of date again, and they'd be ripped out, and you'd have to upgrade again to something completely new. It's just not practicable to keep every installation fully up to date all the time, especially when the Brian Nylon boffins who write this rubbish make so many mistakes in it and keep issuing amendments because they're so behind the times with what's going on in the industry and they keep on making mistakes in their own publications. It's, it's nonsense. I'm, I'm talking far too long here. I'm probably need to 
to not, not to shite so much. Let's, uh, let's have a look at this report. So now, like I say, I have blanked it out. And as I say, the, the reason for producing this report is, as the guy says, to confirm the installation meets current wiring regulations. Well, it's got no chance of doing that, unless it's been overhauled in the last couple of years, in which case they should have an electrical installation certificate which covers their ass. Unsatisfactory, it says it in red there. So there you go. That's right. pretty... Estimated age of the wiring system, 30 years. Well, it's 21 years, isn't it? I doubt this installation predates the sticker on that board which says 1999. Certainly looks modern enough to me. Um, there are a bunch of observations and there is one C2 on here which we will look at later. There's more than one C2 on here <laughs> on the sheet there but this is the bit we're interested in at the moment, the schedule of test results. And it looks like, to be fair to them again, it looks like they've done a, a thorough job, on the face of it at least, everything is listed there. I don't quite agree with a couple of things there, for example, insulation resistance, line to neutral, he's got as not applicable. Well, it's not not applicable. It's, it may be a limitation, but he hasn't listed any limitations. Limitation is not applicable, he says. He likes it's not applicable. Uh, you don't do line neutral IR testing, that's fine. If that's a limitation on you, they put it down as a limitation and say why in the limitations it hasn't been done. Other than that, we do have R1, R2 data. We do have, where's the, we do have measured ZSs. IR apparently is over 500 mega ohm across the board. Right? Oh no, actually, no, yes. This is iCertify. I don't like iCertify. I used them in 2016 um, and I found that it was, it's probably changed since, but I found that it was buggy and they weren't open to feedback. So anyway, um, in, I'm just uh, interested in insulation resistance, live, live, live neutral, live earth. Uh, yeah, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, live live with three phase, that's why he's got not applicable there. So apparently he has measured live neutral, he has measured live earth, he has measured neutral earth. Everything is over 500 mega ohm. Well that's good isn't it? Very good. Tip top that then this installation appears to be. So according to this, all the circuits have good earthing, all the circuits have good insulation resistance, all the circuits have a breaker that is rated for the size of the cable in use. We're going to go now and take our own, we're going to effectively replicate all this, get our own data, make sure it matches up, take it from there, and um, like I say, we're, we're here all day, mate. Cheers. As always, we start with a quick operational test and do all the lights turn on. Do all the sockets don't buzz out with a very basic socket tester, that's going to indicate if anything's got reverse polarity or a missing earth. It's, uh, as I say, it's just just a, a quick heads up to make sure that everything is as we expect it to be. We go around, we check all the accessories, make sure nothing's cracked, nothing's broken. Just a basic starting point for us. It helps to familiarise ourselves with the installation. There's an amazing boiler in it, the best I've seen. Proper retro. I just got a... A bit of a spring on for this bad boy. I tell you what, it does look a bit Robbie the Robot, doesn't it? It looks like something out of Forbidden Planet, this Great. thing does. I am Balsa Coil 3. <laughs> Got a mind of its own. Do you reckon it comes out the cupboard at night and trundles around the place? <laughs> yeah, it comes out and vax the place. <laughs> <laughs> That's just brilliant. I like the retro look. Yeah, it's a Banksy boiler, all right. And we're away. I've got a loop on between line and CPC for the cooker circuit, which is circuit number one. Cooker switch is currently off. Now I'm going to be testing it at the end point, of course, which means we've got to drag the oven out. Fortunately, that wasn't a problem here. It can be in some places. And um, we should get open circuit here, shouldn't we, Nige? Because, as I say, the isolator's off. Let's just uh, climb over and click that on. This is a six mil cable with 2.5 mm CPCs. Boards on the other side of the wall there, so we're probably looking at something around the 0 0.1 something mark. What have we got, Nigel? 0.12. Oh. Marvellous. The previous chat recorded 0.15, which I felt was perhaps a little bit high for the circuit run, but you know, 0 0.12, 0 0.15. You say potato, I say you're a tomato. Fat bottomed hamster lover. <laughs> Faff off you clown. <laughs> Right, um, we'll take a peek behind the isolator as well, just to make sure everything's tight and secure there, and then uh, 
that will be uh, oh, we've just got the, the hob to look at i'm glad it's nige on his knees in there and not me i should go and do the clever stuff nige tends to walk around with the metrol the metro led by 3100s whereas i tend to use the mft pro uh, back at the board for um, the ir testing side of things we do have a uh, bit of damage to the main switch there that wasn't on the previous report Interesting board this. Uh, you can see there's two main switches. This is the peak side, so it's powered 24-7. This is off-peak. Only goes live when the off-peak meter tells it to. We've got four storage heaters hanging off here. So uh, this side of the board doesn't currently have power even if we switched it on. And the meter outside controls when it does. Just quickly do insulation resistance on this cooker circuit. I'm not going to show testing of all these circuits. Is the isolator off, Nige? Yeah. We're going line to neutral, ignore the blue, the fact that the, the clip is blue, I've lost my black clip. Um, we're going line to neutral, 500 volts the, to the isolator, not past the isolator for line to neutral. And that's, that's just a limitation on site because it would mean having to disconnect the oven and the hob. And I don't want to have to get into taking the kitchen apart for goodness sake. So I'm going to test line to neutral only up to the isolator and not into the appliances because obviously that would give me a crap number. Jolly good. This is currently set to test for 10 seconds. And we can see it's off scale high at 999. The previous guy recorded 500, was it, mega ohm? And that's obviously perhaps a limitation of his test that it doesn't go up as high as mine, perhaps, or something like that. Uh, if, can you switch the isolator on now, Nige? Now I'm gonna do line and neutral join together to earth. And then that will give me an in indication of any problems to earth going past the isolator. Oh, you see, now that drops right down. We're down at eight point, well, it's, it's rising slightly. It's rising um, as the, the DC voltage persists through that circuit, but we're getting only 8.25 line neutral to earth so i'm guessing perhaps the last guy only tested up to the isolator Maybe. Uh, and had he done a line neutral to earth test past the isolator then that would have indicated that things aren't necessarily as rosy as they might appear but then it's obviously the appliance itself that's dragging that down the oven um yeah. dragging that down it's not really a fault with the fixed wiring but 8.25 is the number we got past the isolator. 8.25 is what we're going to be sticking down. Uh, it's, it's lower than I'd like to see, but it's still a pass. Obviously, um, 1 is the minimum prescribed by 7671, and anything below 2 you ought to be taking a closer look at. Uh, but we shall say on the report, under the limitations, that the line neutral testing for this circuit was only up to the isolator. So for our cooker circuit, which is a 6mm by 2.5mm cable, uh, 32 amp we can see our maximum permitted ZS is 1.10 ohms we've recorded an R1 R2 of 0 0.12 ohms uh, line to neutral uh, insulation resistance testing came out at over 999 mega ohm and live to earth dropped to 8.25 mega ohm after the isolator we can take a ZS measurement here we'll take it from the socket on the uh, cook a control unit later on but obviously we'll do all the live tests once we finish the dead tests and put the power back on so in a general condition of the installation i've made a note there that the cooker circuit insulation resistance between line and neutral and earth drops after the isolator uh, to a lower number and obviously i can tell the landlady that it may be that her oven is on its way out this lazy ass buttered crumpet okay. smoking a jolly bang out the window while i do all the work Madness, isn't it? Anyway, we're starting to look at the socket outlets now. Obviously, the previous chap didn't have all the accessories off. He did say on his report he looked at the complete installation, but I've just had to use my uh, my blade to break the paint around this socket. And so I, I suspect that he didn't get behind all of them. It's grommeted, nothing wrong there. All looks okay. I did notice on his report that he gave the coding about fly lead earthings to metal boxes. I presume he means a fly lead from here to the, the metal box in the wall being absent. If there's a fixed lug, as there is here, we've got an adjustable one on the left and a fixed one on the right, then you don't need a fly lead. Personally, I like to see them. I often put them in 
because you can't guarantee that Joe Homebase isn't going to pull a, an accessory off while the thing is live and then a, leave some a potentially exposed metal work that so if there's any breakdown of insulation going on back there could be fizzing away uh, it's it's not it's not a something that you would put on the report the, the fact that the fly is just been missing because you are supposed to turn the power off before you take any accessories off the wall obviously we don't always i mean i'm just as guilty as any other sparky for having taken stuff off the wall while it's still powered but there you go that's uh, a lack of a fly lead to the bat box isn't isn't a thing is it nigel uh nigel's done the ring end to ends so he's measured continuity between the two ends of the ring and you know what i get a lot of people on in the comments on these videos saying why do you silly bum fiddler brits still use rings what are you dog fondlers yeah i'm afraid we are i agree i think they're they're a throwback they're not needed yeah. anymore it was something that came in after world war ii to save copper to cut down on the amount of radial circuits required spidering around a house you could have a house built with one high power ring socket outlet circuit uh, rather than having two or three uh, lower power radial circuits house builders in this country are slow to adopt slow to adapt yeah they just keep on building them like this uh, and there are proponents for rings uh, we're not one of them no we don't install them it's, they work of course uh, and they're fine until again Joe home base comes along with his christmas cracker socket outlet that he's just bought from well from home base yep because it looks shiny and he doesn't really know what he's doing it doesn't do the connections up tightly and all of a sudden you don't have two parallel paths going back to your 32 amp breaker anymore you only have one and you don't know it and you don't know it because everything appears to work uh, until the time that you plug your toaster and kettle into the uh, the same part of uh, the broken ring and end up cooking your wiring rather than your crumpets so uh yeah we agree we're with you rest of the world we're we're anti-brexit aren't we Nigel? no we're not not anti-brexit at all uh, now I just measured the ring continuity end to end as 0 0.58, 0 0.57 and 0.94. Is that 0.94 correct? Well, if we take the 0.58 of the 2.5mm line wire and multiply it by 1.67 because the CPC is 1.67 times thinner, the math says we should have something around 0.96, 0 0.97. So 0 0.94 is within spec. You don't want to be more than 0 0.05 of an ohm out. So, you know, it's a good ring. And again, we've not seen so far any evidence of any modifications, any changes. I think this place is as built. These are the original Crabtree sockets be, yeah. that were put on in 99. Where are we? He got about the same numbers and he's reading an R1, R2 of 0.38. Does that maths work? Again, let's get the old calculator out. If we take our line oops, resistance, because it is resistance rather than impedance here really, isn't it? 0.58, um, add that to our CPC, which was 0.94. We get 1.52 because there are two lines and two CPCs going back to the board. We'll divide it by four and we should get a reading of about 0.38. And uh, that, is that what you got? Yeah, you got 0.38. Where is it? There it is. So we should see the same thing. You should see that. Let's do it. Let's do it. What a pants stain. Mucky trucker. Yeah. Right, Martian has plugged into one of the sockets, so obviously we're going to go around them all. We expect something around the 0.38 mark on this circuit according to the mathematics. Nigel, if you'd like to tell you, do the honours. Oh, it's not far off, is it? Again, we, um, we don't want to be not more than 0 0.05 off. No. But I suspect if we were, as Nigel's about to, he's obviously got the same thought. Yes. If we were to place the tester on the contacts at the rear of this socket, we'd probably get a more satisfactory number or the number that we were expecting to get. Uh, often with sockets, you just get a bit of a crappy contact because they're old or they've got a bit of dirt in or the brass just isn't quite making the contact you want it to make and it gives you a slightly higher number. Um, but we're taking all these sockets off anyway, so uh, I suspect that if we put the tester directly onto the contacts at the rear of the socket, would get a better number, slightly better number than we would through the front. Right, well, someone has forced that screw in. We'll have to 
replace the screw. It's, it's always annoying, isn't it, when you take uh, go take an accessory off for uh, inspection and you end up causing damage because the screw breaks or the back box breaks or it doesn't go back on properly or whatever. But what can you do? You've got to get the iron there just to. Yeah, this one been put in cross threaded, forced in. So you need to uh, pull it out. Pull it out, Martian. I've got to be careful what I say about around him because if I say stuff like that, he, he might get his old man out. <laughs> Any excuse, isn't it, Nige? Oh, yes. I'd like to get the old man The old man's old man. Oh, sorry for the delay, mate. This one is. Come on, my battery's running out. Most definitely. Stop. The audience is already bored of this, the most boring video we've ever produced, where it's all waffle. <sighs> You might want to fast forward this bit. So I'm going to go and have a, a coffee. Or oh, a new faff and prat. Jesus, look at the angle of that. Did you put these accessories in, Nigel? Oh, that was a good old day. It's still on it, look. Oh, it's coming cool, then, it's cool. There you go. Well, we'll have to recut that. But let's, uh, let's just soon. quickly see if we get a better reading here. Obviously, if we come to cross a socket outlet where we get a really crap reading from the front, then that could be indicative that the outlet itself has got loose connections, mechanically dirty, uh, physically uh, buggered in some kind of way. Hang on, that makes you all properly. You've really got to stab those probes in. There you go, 0.39, slightly better. But yeah, so we always expect a slightly worse result from the front of the socket outlet. Because, because it is a connection point, you are, you are sliding two pieces of brass together to connect them and there, there may be reasons why they don't quite have, well, they're, they're never gonna have a perfect resistance, are they? Dirt and oxidization. And that's just your underpants. Yes. <laughs> no gas here. So we're going to test the water bond using a wander reel. This is what I made. I made you one of these, didn't I, Nigel? Did. Have you still got it or have you binned it? No, I've still got it. I just bought a cough for <laughs> Made this years ago, years ago. It looks like it as well, doesn't it? Made out of an old extension lead. It's just, uh, I don't know, 50 odd metres or whatever of uh, two five single in beautiful brown with a bloody connector block at one end and a banana plug terminal at the other. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I've disconnected the water bond at the board there, the water bond cable. I'm going to, excuse me, spool out as much as I need. And I'm going to null this out because I don't want the resistance of this wire to affect my reading. Because what I want to do is I want to check that the cable from that end uh, is correctly bonded to the point at that end. And we should get a reading of under 0.05 ohms. So first of all, let's null this out. If I to see what, what resistance we get out of this. Should be about point, yeah, okay. 0.62, I was gonna say 0.5 something. So I'm gonna null the tester out. Oh, your glasses just fall off now. They did just fall off. Those funny shaped ears you've got. Right, so I've nulled out the resistance of the wander lead itself. Now I'm going to connect this end to my disconnected bond cable. The name's Bond. James Bond. Shaken, not stirred, much money penny. Do you prefer it shaken or stirred, Nigel? Um, I don't know, but I bet they're both quite exciting, aren't they? Yeah. Right, so I'm going to plug that into my Wonder Lead. I'm going to connect this onto the clamp itself. Let's get it onto there. Well, oh, you've got that very zoomed in, Nigel. Yeah. Marvellous. Oh, so that's, uh, that's obviously within 
the specification means, but let's get it onto the actual copper itself, away from the clamp, just to make sure that the clamp has got good continuity to the copper, and yes, it does. So I'm satisfied that my water bond is doing the mother stuffing business. On the schedule of test results, I've actually put the bond number, all a bunch of not applicables, except for the seldom used R2 column, which doesn't see a lot of loving, does it? Well, most of the time, but uh, because we're measuring an actual R2 here for the water bond, well, it gets its place on our uh, schedule of test results. So there's nowhere else to record it, really, isn't it? We want to show that we've done it, we went in the effort. Right, so we've got our numbers, with the exception of ZS's, because we haven't powered back on yet. No. That's because Nigel is still standing there holding the front of the board. Yes. Uh, and the reason why he's holding the front of the board is I just want to show that the top of the board is intact. I just want to show that before it goes back on. Well, you sure. All, all sides. The, all sides are intact. intact. There are no holes, no cuts. It closes for me. And I'm mentioning that now because it's going to come up later. Right then. We're done. Uh, we've been through this installation. Let's compare what we found to what our um, other trap has found. First thing to say about this report that this other guy has done is it's not a drive-by. Uh, the last video we did looking at an 85 quid EICR, that was just, just pure nonsense. Nonsense it was. Nothing but nonsense. There's some diligence to this. Uh, he has spent the time on site. He has gone through the all the circuits. He has correctly identified where everything is. He's got his test results, which we concur with. It's just his conclusions that we don't. There are a few mistakes on here that we'll just have a run through and, and do a comparison. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll put forward why we've got what we've got compared to what he's got. And you can slay us in the comments if you think we've done it wrong. But uh, well. We're going to try and back up what we say here. I'm sorry about this old fruit bat sticking his fluffy, fishy smelling, fanny shaped, donkey fiddling, bum sucker, knobby face in frame. Anyway, uh, so as I said already, uh, condition uh, reason for producing this report to confirm the installation meets the current current wiring regulations. Well, that's not really the reason for producing the report. The reason for producing the report is to verify that it's electrical safe, electri electrically safe for ongoing rental of the property. We know it doesn't meet the current versions of the wiring regulations and few rental properties today will. And certainly not all the ones up for rent in England are going to by 1st of July 2020 because as I said before, there's not enough electricians to bring them up to speed. But there's no requirement for it to be brought up to speed. But I've already whiffled on about that, so let's let's come let's go back to this. Estimated age of wiring system 30 years, it's 21 years. We're confident that this is as built, that it was built in 99. Uh, there have been there's absolutely no signs of any modifications anywhere, are there? It's all no. all original as it was, and it was done to a, a fine standard when it was done. Uh, yes. There's no nothing that we've seen that we thought that looks like a builder special. No, nope. no, it all looks uh, it all looks all right. Uh, whoever the sticker that was on the board there, I don't know if they're still in business, but yeah, they did a good job. Uh, so we're still on the old wiring colours here. There's no evidence that any new wiring colours are in place. Extent of the electrical installation covered by this report: whole installation. Well, we've had everything off haven't we and there are some accessories yeah. that we've had to break the paint to to get them off yes so uh, although he's certainly looked at the installation as a whole he hasn't looked at 100 percent of the installation but uh, agreed limitations not applicable i don't know there's, there's always limitations yeah. i find they don't need you breaking into their walls to check that everything's 50 mil exactly so. that i mean uh, going back to extent of it, the electrical installation we've put visual inspection of suppliers equipment because obviously we've looked at what the suppliers got out there but we're not going to take that apart full inspection and testing of all final circuits and earthing bonding arrangements he's just put whole installation and uh, as far as agreed limitations go he's saying not applicable we're saying no disturbance to the fabric of the building. We're not going to break into your walls, as Nigel just said, to make sure cables are in prescribed zone. We're not going to start pulling down the ceiling. We're not going to uh, lift, carpets. lift carpets or anything like that. We're, we're not disturbing the fabric of the building to physically verify wiring runs. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a limitation on any report we do. Uh, we're also saying here that we've not tested line neutral for IR 
on any circuit where we can't confirm all loads have been isolated. An example of that being the lighting. We can IR up to the switches if they're off, line to neutral, potentially, but uh, for the rest of it, we've got a couple of class one fittings. We've been behind them to check the um, check the other yeah. thing, but we're not going to start disconnecting light fittings and removing lamps to check IR between line and neutral because it's just not practicable on a lot of sites. We also say ZS testing. We only perform on circuits with a uh, plug and socket arrangement, and that's because a ZS test is obviously a live test, and we want to limit the number of live tests that we expose ourselves to. I'm quite happy to plug the tester into a socket outlet in order to get a, a ZS reading. But if we've got something like a pendant light uh, and we've already verified the external impedance uh, to the building and the R1, R2 impedance or resistance really of the earth fault loop path for that lighting circuit, there's no need to double check that both those numbers add up by doing a, a live ZS test because it means balancing on top of a ladder or a hop up, potentially with three probes being pushed into place, especially if you're on an RCD, and trying to hit the test button on your tester, you know, a bit of a slip and you could you could come into contact with live parts. So uh, we limit ZS testing to where we can access endpoints without exposing ourselves to live brass, live copper. Uh, and again, you know, as long as we've got the ZE and R1, R2, then we know the earth loop impedance path is good. We don't necessarily need a ZS reading to go with that. General condition of the installation needs some remedi remedial work to bring the installation up to current wiring regulations. Does it? Does it need it? Does it need it? Yes. What he says is true. It needs some work to bring it up to current wiring regulations, but does it, does it need bringing up to those it's current the, the wiring It's the necessity of it, isn't it? Yes. yes. Uh, if you want to bring it up to current wire, wire, wiring regulations, then some work is required. Does it need to be brought up to current wiring regulations? Let's move on to that a little bit later. Page two. There's some silly mistakes here, some odd mistakes. Schedules, the attached schedules are part of this document. These are not applicable for schedule inspection, not applicable for schedule of test results. But there is a schedule of inspection and there is a schedule of test results, so you should say, well, there is one of each enclosed with this yes. report. Unlike, again, that bogus report we saw on the previous video, the £85 ICR video, where matey no balls left his schedule of test results out entirely. TNCS, uh, we concur with his prospective fault current, his external impedance, I think we concur with that. Let's check what we measured. Oh no, actually we got, um, we got a much lower number than he did for external fault impedance and therefore a higher fault current. But you know, it changes it can change, can't it? Yes. It's still well within spec, so let's not uh, worry too much. Interesting, he's put down a fuse type BS1361 Type 2 100 amp. There's a fuse, uh, a red fuse link out there. Uh, I don't know where the incoming supply is. We haven't seen it. No. Uh, we can't see any intake room downstairs that we can access. So I wonder whether he's just guessed that. Or just put that down. Maybe just put that down on all of them. But, but even then, because you can't take a fuse out and you can't trust the label that's on it, how would you know what the well, fuse is? Well, to be honest, if the label specified it was a BS 1361 Type 2 at 100 amps or 80 amps or whatever or BS 88, I would just put that down because I, I wouldn't second guess the label. Uh, I know that often the carrier is rated. Um, let's get an idea in frame because he, he has input here. I know the carrier is often rated. Um, and for 100 amps and may not necessarily contain a 1361 amp fuse in there. I did see on I think Group E5 channel where they showed the inside of several fuse carriers to show that an 80 amp is an 80 amp, 100 amp is 100 amp because they're physically different sizes inside. Right. Maybe worth you taking a look at the E5's channel for that. Confirmation of supply polarity not applicable. Mm -hmm. There's no polarity within this. Yeah, that's weird. Isn't it? Electrical system it seems. Obviously, it is applicable and it's easily verifiable, so I'm assuming that's some kind of mistake. But there's a few silly errors like this where, you know, there's just been some proofreading's been missing. Uh, water bonded, that's all correct for the main switch. We'll move on to his observations. Let's know, let's do the observations now actually, because he has made six observations. Do we agree with his observations? We have made. How many ourselves? We've made five. 
let's just quickly run through his first one. Uh, well, for, for some of these. First one, absence of warning notices, C3. Okay, what does that relate to? The only thing I can see on his schedule of inspections that this relates to is presence of alternative supply warning notice at or near consuming unit stroke distribution board, C3. Do they have solar? No or solar. Generator, generator in all one? No, uh, um, there is no alternative supply warning notice, or, or no alternative supply here. So. I don't know where that came from. There's no, he doesn't expand on that to say why that's given, um, but that looks iffy to me. Yeah. So, as far as I can see, the consuming is labelled up. We're going to improve the circuit labelling. We've got our brother printer down there to improve the circuit labelling, but there's no missing warning notice that we can see. Number two, absence of RCD, C2. Okay. This is where things are going to go with cock, isn't it? C2, uh, RCD provided for fault protection, C2. RCD provided for additional protection, C2. First of all, we don't need an RCD for fault protection here. You would use an RCD for fault protection where you can't guarantee uh, your protected devices are going to function within their prescribed times, usually because your external impedance is too high, so something like a TT installation, um, perhaps an outbuilding remote to the property, or uh, a TT around a pool or basin, external pool or basin, something like that. That's where you'd find an RCD for fault protection. The RCDs, uh, again, we're in a flat, we're not on the ground floor, there are no outbuildings, there are no external sockets, there's nothing here where you've got any kind of external cabling going out that would require an RCD for fault protection itself. It's a PME system, we verified that the uh, earth fault loop impedance path externally is within prescribed limits. So you don't need an RCD for fault protection. It's it should all with with the kind of circuit impedances we've got, earth fault loop impedances and the external impedance we've got, we can we can guarantee that these protective devices made to BSEN 60898 will operate within the 0.4 second requirement that they need to operate in. So we don't need to provide an additional device that will trip off quicker because we can't guarantee those devices will work, because we can guarantee those devices will work. Yeah. So, um, I, I think, uh, and this came up before again in that previous video, that a lot of people get confused between RCDs provided for fault protection and additional protection. The RCD in your consumer unit that's there at 30 milliamps is just for additional protection, it's not for fault protection. Um, so that's not applicable. So that, that first one's nonsense. RCDs provide for, provide for additional protection, he's put as a C2. Yeah, there's no RCD here, is there? No. The thing with RCDs is, I don't know when they came into the regulations. I know that in 17th edition in 2008, the regulations started tightening up on RCDs and saying you had to start putting RCDs on all socket outlets, mm -hmm. unless you stuck a label on to say it was an yeah. exception. Prior to that, my understanding is, uh, for sort of 15th, 16th edition, RCDs were a bit more woolly, and I, I believe, and I'm not sure, because it was before my time, so you'll have to let me know in the comments, I believe the, the stipulation was an RCD would be fitted for equipment being used outdoors. I don't know when that came in, whether that was in 15th or 16th, but it's not unusual to see uh, pre-2008 installations lacking RCDs on some or all circuits. Now, we don't have an RCD for additional protection on an, any of the circuits here. Is that a safety issue? Hmm. Well, for decades, before someone invented the RCD, yes. your protection against shock was via earthing. The earth path provided a lower, lower impedance to your body, so if you touch something that was metallic and live, if it were earth, the current would be going down the earth rather than going through you. Uh, the RCD is braces to your belt. It allows the circuit to trip off automatically should it detect that current is leaking elsewhere. Definitely good to have. I would always recommend on an older installation an RCD is put in. But it would be just that, a recommendation. 
this installation is built to the standards of its time. Everything that needs to be earthed is earthed, and that earth path is good going out. Yes. So there shouldn't be a shock risk. Now I know you could say, well, okay, uh, what if I'm locking a, a nail in the wall to hang up a picture, uh, and I catch the line wire in a twin in earth? Uh, that may all then become alive, and there's you know, there's no there's no sort of shock protection then. Yeah, that's the kind of circumstance that an RCD would catch that good earthing wouldn't. Yeah. And the question really comes down to, should the tenants have an expectation to have all the whistles and bells available to the industry to protect them? Or are they okay with... Just a good, safe install? With the standard that, yeah, that was around when this place was built. And that's that's where this, this grey area comes, because the government advice says, oh no, you give your tenants all the whistles and bells, and then later on in the same document it says, well, older installations may not comply but may still be safe if they're built to the, the standards they were built to, and those standards were suitable at the time. All of these remaining C2s on this page are because of lack of RCD protection, no RCD in a bathroom, um, no RCD for uh, cables concealed in walls at a depth of less than 50 millimetres, for circuits supplying luminaires within domestic household premises, that's only something that's just come in in the 18th edition. <laughs> So the missing RCD protection on internal circuits, is that an issue? Well, ordinarily, until now, I've gone by the likes of Napit Code Breakers, for example, and this guy doing this report is a Napit member. Napit Code Breakers, uh, section 419, page 29. No RCD protection for socket outlets for internal use. C3, improvement recommended. That's what Napit say. Similarly, Electrical Safety First, Best Practice Guide 4 that you can download on the internet. Code C3, Improvement Recommended, applies to absence of RCD protection for a socket outlet that is unlikely to supply portable or mobile equipment for use outdoors, does not serve a location containing a bath or shower, and the use of which is otherwise not considered by the inspector to result in potential danger. Similarly, absence of RCD protection for cables installed at a depth of less than 50 millimetres from a surface of a wall, absence of RCD protection for AC final circuits supplying luminaires in domestic household premises, absence of RCD protection for circuits of a location containing a bath or shower where satisfactory supplementary bonding is present, as it is here, we've verified that. These are all C3s according to Electrical Safety First, and that's the way we've always gone by it. It's not for us to, to come along and say, right, now that's suddenly dangerous, because it's not necessarily. You've got good earthing throughout the premises to provide your shop protection. RCDs are only there for additional protection on top of that shop protection. So it's not dangerous that they're missing, because you have your primary means of shop protection. It's a recommendation that you need to pass on, in my opinion, to the homeowner or the landlord to say, look, I recommend that you put this additional protection in. It's it's for the benefit of your tenants. There, there's no immediate shock risk here. Uh, that there's no live parts exposed. There's no damaged equipment. Unless the tenants start knocking things into walls, <laughs> which you know they perhaps arguably shouldn't be doing in the first place, uh, then it shouldn't be an immediate danger. It should or sorry, it shouldn't be dangerous. So when it comes to RCDs. This is where this inspector and I differ because I don't believe it is a C2 condition, I think it's a C3 condition. And I'm backed up there by Electrical Safety First and by NAPIT. Let's quickly move on. Number three, this is another sticking point, of course, another pain in my quacking ass. The consume unit. Oh, this is interesting, actually. This is interesting. There's a contradiction here. The consumer unit, also known as a fuse board at the premises, is not made of a non-combustible enclosure. This is an advisory note and does not mean the electrical installation is unsafe. That's what this guy has said, and he see-through'd it. So he's basically saying it's got a plastic consumer unit, <coughs> and he's put that down as improvement recommended. And he's actually said on there, this is an advisory note. It does not mean the electrical installation is unsafe. His words. Now look at this, schedule of inspections, which then goes on to immediately contradict that by giving condition of enclosure for the consumer unit in terms of IP rating, a C2, and condition of enclosures in terms of fire rating, another C2. So what do we go on here? Do we go on 
the schedule of inspections which say that the enclosure is a C2 or do we go on the observations which say it's a C3? Again, plastic consumer units, I've ranted about these before. A 17th edition Amendment 3 was just a Rogering. godsend to cowboy installers, wasn't it? Because any asshole can now walk into some little old lady's house, suck air through his teeth at the probably beautifully installed uh, yeah. and perfectly safe plastic consumer unit that some proper tradesperson, proper electrician took pride in installing a few years ago and made a good job of and say, oh, you can't have that anymore, rips it off the wall, sticks on a metal enclosure full of holes, yeah. poorly done, uh, complete disregard to IP rating, electromagnetic effects, ceiling, fire ceiling, all this kind of shit, it just gets thrown on the wall and they end up with something that's in a worse state than it was before. I'm no fan of metal consumer units. I think it was all just so badly thought out. And this nonsense here just adds to that because again, now we've got this situation where landlords are being told you must get an inspection and it must be 218th edition. Well, metal consumer units haven't been around since January 2016, or at least that's when it started getting enforced. So anything older than 2016 is potentially gonna be failed. And that's exactly what What's going on here? This guy is saying that your consumer unit, well, I don't know, he's saying both things. He's saying that this is okay, and then he goes on to say, well, no, it's not. In terms of IP rating, well, we showed you the condition of that consumer unit. There's not a hole in it, is there? No, no. And although there are a couple of spare ways in the front, they're covered over yeah, by blanks. Right? Yeah. So there is no problem with IP rating, that's demonstrable. In terms of fire rating, well, as I said in the last video, how's it going to catch fire? Is it going to catch fire because it's damaged or deteriorated or showing signs of thermal damage? Let's have a look. Oh, his own report says that they're all ticks. Um, same with things like loose connections. Um, it's, it, it's, it's all ticked off. Everything's ticked off. He's ticked off that connections are tight and secure. Uh, that the enclosure is not damaged, deteriorated, there's no sign of thermal, there's nothing here to say that there's any thermal damage, any signs of overheating, there's no insulation resistance problems that might cause shorting or arcing, there's no, the um, protected devices are all correctly rated for the wiring that they're supporting. His own report says all this, so why is it going to suddenly catch fire? And is a plastic board going to contain a fire any better than, better than a metal board that some asshole has left full of holes? Because he's twatted out the knockouts and not sealed anything up. Again, let's see what Napit say about it. He's a member of Napit. See you in a domestic household premises is not metal or installed in a non-combustible cabinet, is showing no signs of thermal damage, and is located in the sole means of escape route for a dwelling area, as this is. C3, improvement recommended. It would be a C2 if it were showing signs of damage, of course, but this isn't. But it's a C3 if it's in a sole escape route or under wooden stairs. Uh, if it's not in a sole escape route or under wooden stairs, it's simply not applicable. This is what they pit say. Let's see what electrical safety first say. Presence of a consumer unit or similar switch gear made from combustible material, e.g. plastic, that is not inside a non-combustible enclosure and which is located under one staircase or within a solid escape route from a premises. C3, improvement recommended, unless there's signs of damage, but there's not here. So again, you've got electrical safety first and NAPIT saying, no, that, that's not a C2 condition. And to be fair to him, he's put it down as a C3, but he's also put it down as a C2, so I don't know what to go on there. But um, as far as we're concerned, there's nothing about that board that says that we ought to class that as dangerous. No, nothing. Because there's no reason why it ought to be catching fire. So we don't have to worry about it containing a fire no. because we've gone through with our torque screwdriver, everything's tight, everything's secure, it's the right, right protected devices, IR's okay. There, there's nothing, there's nothing, nothing. 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 Bugger all. Bugger all. So those are the two big sticking points and I'm getting messages and phone calls from people all over the country saying, I've seen your website where you say these things aren't problems or I've seen on YouTube saying these things are pro aren't problems but I've had an electrical inspector in and he's given me this unsatisfactory report telling me I've now got to change my consumer unit. And again, the trouble is if you do that, if you bring this up to 18th edition standard, these mushy splashes. 
are going to come along in a few years time with 19th edition or 18th edition amendment Ruddy. whatever and they're going to say right we want AFDDs on all circuits now so and all of a sudden you'll be facing another expensive upgrade to change your 18th edition board from non-AFDD to AFDD because it's not it's not financially viable to buy and install AFDDs at the moment. At least I don't yeah. know anybody who's doing it, and because the regulations at present say that well, we kind of recommend it, but they're they're not stipulating it until they do. Who's going to do it? Jesus. Number four. This is curious. No earth to metal bat boxes. C three. Mm. What fun does that mean? Well, I assume he means tails to knockout boxes. Yes. You don't need tails to knockout boxes. And if they've got a fixed lug, I'll tell you what, there's bugger all in the regulations about that. You won't find a regulation saying, bow shout, put a tail onto a metal knockout box. The most you'll see on that is perhaps in regulation 4.0.3.9, part 3, where it talks about exposed conductive parts and significant contact but that's really all you'll find in the regs themselves about that other than that there's the selection and erection and the earthing and bonding books each of which have a passage that says flush metal accessory boxes with at least one fixed lug are effectively earthed via the tight metal to metal contact of the fixing screw and again they say it's always desirable to provide an earthing tail and we usually do can't say we do every time but it's not a requirement and it shouldn't be coded as a C3 here. All our sockets here are plastic, so the only exposed metalwork on the front is via the screws. Those screws are connected to the earth that's going into the sockets. Those screws are then going into the metal back box and providing the earthing for the back box. Yes, it's true that if you take that socket out off with it while it's still energized, then the back box is no longer could potentially go live if it's in contact with something that's got bad insulation yes. resistance or if that if the live wire pings off and touches that metal work but you're not supposed to be working live just done a quick search on uh, on back box fly leads and again napits they code it as a c3 where you've got an insulated accessory like our plastic sockets here and there is a lack of a fixed lug on the back box so uh, if you had two adjustable lugs it would be a c3 uh, if it's but only if you've got adjustable lugs if it's a um, a fixed lug it doesn't apply as a coding interestingly electrical safety first are a little bit different on this one they would see two adjustable lugs as a non-compliance if there's no fly lead but they say it doesn't give rise to danger and doesn't require reporting so they electrical safety first wouldn't see through it nape it would in this case, it doesn't apply because we have a fixed lug on our back boxes. We've checked them all, haven't we? We've spent oh, yeah. all accessories off. We haven't come across any with just adjustable lugs. And you wouldn't expect it on a property of this age either. So, no earth metal back boxes. C3, <laughs> nonsense. Smoke detector is out of date and needs replacing. Interestingly, um, we do put all of our smoke detectors on our reports. So we do. We put. Um, we'll, we'll note it. We won't. Um, we'll put down, for example, smoke detector needs replacing, blah de blah or whatever. It's actually out of scope, really, isn't it? This, we're here for to produce a report on the electrical safety installation. Things like smoke detectors are out of scope. They're not part of BS seven six seven one. They're not part of the reporting procedure, really. I see it as a, a good to do. Yes. rather than anything else. The same with things like CO detectors and their, their absence, presence or um, suitability for continued use. If you choose to put them on there, fine, up to you. It's not really a within scope of uh, condition reporting. He has correctly stated it is out of date and needs replacing and we are going to do that for the client today. We're going to go off and get one and do that. The last item, again, now I'm going to look this one up because I haven't looked this one there, but it's interesting. Switch lines not identified as line conductors. C3. So what he's saying there is that where you've got, because this is old colours, you've got a black and red cable going into the back of a switch. Uh, he's saying that the, the black looks like a neutral, whereas it's really a switch line. Yeah. However, 
We've had all these switches off and they're all sleeved red, aren't they? They're all ID'd. Yeah, so Ooh. I don't know, maybe that's just the line he sticks on all his reports because most of the time, more often than not... Yeah, it's true, most of the time they're not done, but, but in this property... I don't know where he's got that from, but interestingly, and we, and we do note that on our reports as well, where we come across it, we say switch yeah. lines not identified. However, electrical safety first, say, don't bother. Where if it's just a switch and you've got two wires going to it, then bother reporting it. I wonder what nape it say uh, distribution of farm circuits here we go interestingly again nape it seem to do something different to electrical safety first they say line conductors incorrectly identified by color code should be a c3 so we normally record it as a c3 this guy's coded it as a c3 nape it says it's a c3 Electrical safety first, I'm pretty sure. Say so it's not applicable. Here we go. Non compliances with the current edition of BS 7671 that do not give rise to danger and do not require reporting. Switch lines not identified as line conductors at terminations. For example, a conductor having blue insulation is not sleeved brown in switches or lighting points. So, maybe it's say C3. Electrical safety first says it's non-compliance, don't bother reporting it, because it's just not dangerous. There you go. So there are his conclusions, and it's basically the lack of RC protection plastic consumer unit that he has um, failed the installation on. Our conclusions differ slightly. Uh, because again, yes, it's a plastic consumer unit in a sole escape route. So I'd give that a C3. C3. I yeah. would recommend that it's better to have a properly installed metallic one, even though I don't like them, because if it's properly installed, then it will definitely be better at containing a fire. Although there should be no risk of fire in this current setup as it is. Lack of RCD protection for socket outlets, rated 32 amps or less. For cables concealed in a wall at depth of less than 50 millimeters, for final circuits supplying luminaires and for uh, low voltage circuits serving the bathroom. Basically, the lack of RC protection makes up the remaining items on this list and they're all improvement recommended. My job is to go back to the landlady and say, look, here's the state of this current installation. It complies with the standards of its time, uh, but we recommend that you update it uh, to provide this ad additional uh, protection for your tenants but there should be no risk of death or injury to the tenants as is unless they start doing something stupid like making modifications to the place that they really ought not to be making um, <coughs> if they go and buy a metal light fitting from home base and stick it on the ceiling because they, they want a, a different look to the thing then if they don't know what they're doing and their ham-fisted efforts result in them putting a metal fitting up without and leaving the earthing off then yeah they, they are exposed to they deserve it. <laughs> well they're certainly exposed to a greater risk than a place with an RCD protecting them because the RCD would trip off if they yes. went and touched it whereas uh, here they could still get a, a bit of a belt, but you know, it's oh, gee. Yeah. Going on to his schedule of test results again, it's not a drive-by. We concur with his numbers. He has done a diligent effort of going through everything. There's an odd mistake or three here. He's got a spare circuit. Let's go. That's, that is spare. There's nothing on the buzz bar there, but he's still labelled it as having, a for some reason, a 30 amp breaker and that he's tested it. He's IR'd it. Yeah, he's got the IR test results for it. The, the, the trouble with I certify is it's an iOS app and to use it means stabbing away at an iPad screen or an iPhone screen. And I found that was just awful. Awful! And it was so easy to misclick, misselect. Uh, oh God, I hated it. I hated it with a passion. Oh, what does that say about this? It's because the IR readings are all pretty great here, there's no reason why an RCD couldn't be couldn't be fitted to this site. It would, I would prefer to see RCD protection here, but ultimately it's for the client to decide. This um, this company um, obviously they failed it. 
fail the installation. 192 quid to fail it, but it was a it was a prerequisite failure. They knew when they walked in the door, perhaps even before when the job was booked, they were going to fail it. Because as I said before, anything older than five years is probably going to be a fail. Anything younger than five years is probably covered by an EIC and doesn't need an ICR. Yeah. So he's then come along and said, you need remedial works adding up to 750 quid plus VAT. Now where does that number come from? Because all I can think of that needs doing here is a board replacement. And the cost of a board replacement, which is somewhere between, I don't know, 350 to 500 most of the time, depending on whether you've got yeah. to worry about installing an isolator, upgrading the tails, upgrading the earthing, bonding, etc. If it's just a board upgrade because nothing else needs changing, as this would be, then... You wouldn't even need the initial tests and inspection. Yeah, this is it. Done it. You, know? you might charge like 300 quid or 350 quid, something like that, for a, for a straight board swap out. But most of that charge is taken up by the time to do the testing and inspecting. Because the labour and the materials to do a, a straight board change out on something as simple as this, where you're just one off, one on, wouldn't add up to anywhere near. Yeah, I think he's also of thinking of charging for taking each socket off and... Putting an earth tail Sticking on, an earth in which and is unnecessary. IDing the switches even though they don't need doing. Well, they're already ID'd, aren't they? Yeah. So, uh, but, but even then, that doesn't make... I don't know, I don't know because again, I haven't seen what he's quoted for, but is he quoting just for getting rid of the C2 condition Maybe. so they can reissue the report, or is he quoting for ticking all of these things so off? So for bringing in an RCD, which is the only C2 edition. But all we're talking about here is changing out even if we take all of these things, change out the smoke alarm, change out the consumer unit, which is just an, an off and on, ID some switch drops that don't need ID in, and stick some earth tails in that don't need sticking in. Mm. That's still not 750 quid. Yeah, are we work. undercharging? I think I'd like to be a little bit richer. Mm. But um, Well, I don't know, mate. This is it. This is us trying to do it properly. And here we are. We're... Charging the same as he is for the inspection work. There's yeah. two of us on the job. Yeah. And we've thrown all this time to it because we're, we're filming all this boring ramble. We're, we're also talking ourselves out of a board change because we're going to go back to the client and say, yeah. no, you know what? This installation, in our opinion, is safe enough because it, it meets the standards for shock protection and for overcurrent protection. It just doesn't meet some ch additional changes that have come across yeah. since then. Um... You can you can have that work if you want, but yeah, it's a bit of a nonsense. I mean, there, there's because the test results come out so well because the place hasn't been monkeyed with. There's no reason why we can't on here tick this off as being satisfactory for another five years. Yeah. Now on here, we select five years or change of tenant, stroke owner, and I did see a website that said beware of any electricians who say that change of tenant owner. If they say five years, it should be good for five years. Shouldn't have to check. Have to. Well, it should be. It. Does, isn't that part of? I agree with that to a certain extent. I, 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 why? Well, I, I always look at it. And we, we do a, a lot of work for a, a lot of landlords, and, and the way I look at it is, if we say change of tenant owner, that doesn't necessarily mean the whole clucking thing needs to be done from scratch yeah. again. All it means for us is that we perhaps want to give it a cursory once over to make sure that there aren't any obvious signs that the previous tenant mucked about with yeah, things that should have mucked about. Yeah, has he, has, did, he, did he go put on the lights? Did he try and defeat the meter? Yeah. <laughs> has he done anything that's uh, obviously iffy while he was there? And if we, if we give the place a, a cursory glance, because you might get a tenant only in for six months and you don't, you don't have to pay for a whole new report to be no. recommissioned after that time, but it might be worth us sticking our heads in to look after our landlords to, to, to just check that the place... On a, on a cursory glance, doesn't appear to have been fiddled yeah. with since we were last there. Uh, and if, if not, then you know that, that existing report can remain. We don't have to reissue it. Uh, if there are obvious signs that, of mucking about, then yes, we, we want to have a closer look as to to what is what is what has been done to protect the next tenant. So it's not necessarily that we're trying to people saying five years or change a tenant owner are trying to rip someone off. Uh, it's just a case of. We just want to make sure that things are okay after the tenancy has lapsed. I don't know if there's anything else to really say about this today. No. As I say, yeah, everyone's got different opinions. There are those who 
insist on testing and inspecting to the latest standards using that as the benchmark and failing anything that failed to meet those latest standards and they will be vocal in the comments I'm sure but again I'd like to know do you tell your clients when they book you that you are guaranteed to fail their installation be interesting to know wouldn't it it would <laughs> yes I'll come and I'll come and test that for you do the test and inspect I'm going to charge this much I uh, guarantee I'm going to give you a failure yes um because I'm sure most people would say, oh, no thanks, of course, or no. But then, you know, that, that is, that's what's happening. For us today, uh, apart from changing the smoke alarm, this is all peachy, isn't it? It is. It's all fine. It's fine. But we are going to make our recommendations to an to our client that she think about a board upgrade to bring it to modern standards. And we are quite safe in making that choice because if we ever get hauled up in court because the next tenant died doing something they shouldn't have done because you know it should be safe for them to to use the place as is then we can say well they picked code breakers said it was all okay and electrical safety first said it was all okay and the health and safety executive in this thing said on page 13 that it's all okay so you know we don't have to demand that this installation be brought up to modern standards and hold the homeowner or the landlord to ransom for it. No. Uh, and even, even this government advice page <laughs> says, with all its musts and thou shouts, if you scroll down far enough, you will find under further questions where it says, with all installations have to comply with 18th edition, even if they were installed before this edition was in force, that they themselves say, in practice, if the report does not require investigative or remedial work, the landlord will not be required to carry out any further work. So I'm confident that, you know, our asses are covered by saying that this is okay because we've got all these sources to back us up. So if you're going to say in the comments, well, no, you should be adhering to 18th edition, it must be 18th edition, then um, say so why? Yeah. why? Why are you saying that? Just shout and run. Shout and stay. And explain yourself. Yeah, give us give us a reason why why you believe that to be the case. Why why you're working to the most modern standard on an older installation. Obviously there are advantages to do it, but it's it, it, I don't think this legislation, as I said before, is really there to enforce all landlords to upgrade. I think it's there just to make them ensure that the electrical safety of the place is reasonable enough yeah. and that adding an RCD or a metal box to it doesn't necessarily make it that much safer great to have not necessarily a must have before July in my opinion how about your opinion Nigel? my opinion is I'm starting to get bored. I'm sure these people out here are starting oh my to God, get bored. this is going to be so long, this video. I'll tell you what, uh, let's go and get this smoke detector and yes. um, get this Friday knocked on the head because this is a very long and ranty video. But, um, you know, it's... Yeah, as an inspector, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, aren't you? Yes. Because you, you're getting conflicting information and there are all sorts of people out there who are just writing stuff off and like I say, I keep getting asked about it. And this is the way, as an inspector, I choose to do it. Yeah. Right, let's sign off. Right. Jesus. Oh, fuck. Baby on. Yeah, what a load of dirty bollocks. We've got about an hour and a half of fucking shite recorded here. Oh Christ, we're still recording. <laughs>